Good morning after a tumultuous midterm election night. I'm Jackie Contreras with the wrap up. The, the Democratic Party gained control of the House of Representatives and claimed 220 seats. This one will make it more difficult for President Trump to advance his agenda. Republicans remain in control of the Senate. CNN's Karen Kaifa has more. Democrats projected to take control of the House of Representatives for the first time in eight years, and they did it by winning in key suburban districts in states like Pennsylvania and Virginia. Change is coming to America, and change is coming to Virginia 10. And after focusing their final days less on President Trump and more on health care and the character of the country. Thanks to you, we owned the ground. Thanks to you, tomorrow will be a new day in America. Republicans holding on to the U.S. Senate, boosted by flipping three seats away from vulnerable Democrats in red states, Indiana, Missouri, and North Dakota. But it was a surprisingly close race in Texas that pushed Republicans to that Senate majority. Ted Cruz, besting Democrat Beto O'Rourke. This election was a battle of ideas. It was a contest for who we are and what we believe. President Trump's first reaction to the results, a tweet saying, tremendous success tonight, thank you to all. Trump advisor Kellyanne Conway telling reporters the president had a successful midterm stretch. One big lesson, you just can't get around it, is that he made a difference in so many of these races. And the president called Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell on election night, the first step toward a new dynamic with a new Congress starting in January. Several key races are still too close to call. Arizona's Senate race has not been called as only 15,000 votes separate the two opponents. Republican Rick Scott claimed victory in Florida's Senate race last night, but, opponents, but opponent Bill Nelson has not conceded. Nelson was nearly 35,000 votes behind Scott. The race is headed for a recount. Georgia Governor hopeful Stacey Abrams has also yet to concede in a very close race with Republican Brian Kemp. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren is looking forward to a second term and a continu continuing battle with President Trump. The Democrat conquered with a double-digit victory last night, beating Republican Jeff Deal. The potential presidential candidate blasted what she called President Trump's corrupt administration during her victory speech last night. A woman led a parade of victories for Democrats, including the unopposed election of former BU student Ayanna Presley, who will become the first African-American woman to represent the Bay State in Congress. Another BU-affiliated candidate, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, won a resounding victory in New York's 14th Congressional District. Governor Charlie Baker got a strong mandate from voters to stay in office for a second term. The Republican, who notably opposed President Trump, won handily over his Democratic challenger, Jay Gonzalez. Baker celebrated with a night of high fives last night with his Lieutenant Governor, Karen Polito. BU reporters Alyssa Riddell and Denny Hackett report on the victory celebration. Despite a contentious election season across the country, Charlie Baker won at a 35% margin in Massachusetts. Supporters from both sides of the aisle came out to Heinz Convention Center to celebrate his victory. But we are all Americans, and here we are the sons and daughters of the great people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and when we make progress, we do it by working together. Baker and Polito credited their win on their relationship with the people of Massachusetts. Over the past four years, the two of them have combined to visit each of the 351 towns and cities in the state. You know, Charlie Baker is, to me, he's a bridge builder. He's a uniter. And he, he really shows by his actions, by the things that he does, that he loves his state and he loves all the people in it. And today, today the voters have spoken. And it seems like they like what we're doing and the way we go about it. I think that it's been an excellent four years here in Mass. I think he's been a really solid governor. He's a moderate voice, kind of focused on bipartisan leadership, which is what we'd love to see. With Baker set for another four years in office, the expectation among voters is that he will continue his moderate approach to policies. He said that he and his team will continue to look at issues such as climate change and the opioid crisis. Reporting for Butte News Service, I'm Denny Hackett. 
Jay Gonzalez says he doesn't have a single regret from his campaign despite losing to incumbent Gover Governor Charlie Baker. Gonzalez conceded after just 20% of the vote had been counted. BU News Service's Alejandro Rosa has more from Copley last night. People. Thank you all for being here. Well, it's not exactly the result we were hoping for. But we gave it one hell of a run, didn't we? Although disappointed, the majority of the attendees are not surprised. And the mood here continues exciting and upbeat. I think he tried really hard, but he, he, had, a, he had a tough opponent. I think a lot of people in Massachusetts uh, were very moderate on this particular race. and. They chose the, the current governor. It, it seems like the, the people in Massachusetts are content with having a governor that kind of hangs out and, and doesn't do a whole lot. So I'm disappointed, but it'll, it'll, it'll work out in the long run. In his concession speech, Jay Gonzalez took the opportunity to appreciate the work that Governor Baker has done for Massachusetts during the past four years. Governor Baker also deserves credit and our thanks for the civil, respectful, and collaborative approach he has taken to governing. I'm here at the Democratic Campaign Headquarters at the Fairmont Plaza Copley, where Jay Gonzalez just gave his concession speech, although only 20% of the polls were in at the time. For Boston University, I'm Alejandro Rosa. Gonzalez won Boston with just over 3,000 votes. Massachusetts residents voted overwhelmingly to reject ballot question one. Voters decided if hospitals should be forced to set lower patient-to-nurse ratios. No on one received 70% of the vote, rejecting the measure. Supporters of the measure said it would prevent nurses from being overworked, and opponents said it could force hospitals to turn patients away. BU News Service reporter Crystal Boyajian has our report. The young Democrats of Massachusetts watched at 9.22 p.m. as the Massachusetts Nurses Association conceded with a no vote on question one. Question one proved to be a point of confusion for voters across the state, with some questioning whether it was an appropriate ballot question in the first place. What the ballot question is doing is it's putting in front of voters who are not nurses, not in health care, um, you know, who aren't really informed to make decisions on uh, this kind of a complex uh, labor issue. Representatives for Yes on Safe Patient Limits attributed the confusion to hospital executive funded ads. The other side, though, has spent a lot of money, and this is the thing that I want people to know most of all. They've spent, I think the official count now is around $23 million. Despite losing the ballot measure, the problem of understaffed nurses still exists in the state, and voters are optimistic that there are other ways to solve the problem. You know, I will say that I, I'm hopeful that this, this ballot question fails, but I'm not, uh, I'm hopeful that this conversation keeps going. I guess I don't know what happens, but I'm much more optimistic than I was, you know, four months ago when it felt like nobody was listening. This is never going to be over tonight, whether we win or whether we lose. So we're going to be keeping fighting either way to hold these hospitals accountable. And we're at Club Cafe, where the young Democrats of Massachusetts had their election party tonight. After a 20-year push from the MNA, question one finally appeared on the ballot. And despite its loss, Massachusetts voters don't expect it to go away anytime soon. I'm Crystal Boyajian for BU News Service. A state law guaranteeing transgender protections remains after being upheld by Massachusetts voters. A large majority of voters supported the current law protecting transgender people from discrimination in public places. Critics of the law claimed it allowed sexual predators to invade private spaces for women by claiming a female gender identity. Voters in Massachusetts celebrated last night as question three passed on the ballot. BU News Service's Matt Nixa gives us an inside look into the festivities.
Massachusetts voters overwhelmingly voted to retain the 2016 state law that protects transgender people from discrimination in public places, sparking celebration among supporters of the law at the Fairmont Coffee Plaza on Tuesday evening. It'll send a signal and a, a message to the entire country that uh, transgender people are no longer going to be forgotten about or put uh, in the shadows and that we are a state that accepts and welcomes and honors them uh, here. I think it'll really set the standard for the entire country and hopefully for the world uh, to ensure that people aren't discriminated against simply because of the gender with which they identify. Victory comes as the Trump administration is considering defining sex as binary, which would remove transgender people's protections under Title IX, a federal law that prohibits sex discrimination. We understand what our opposition was going to do in trying to scare people, and so we really wanted to help them understand that transgender people are actually the people who are vulnerable and not the people who are putting anyone at risk. The No on 3 campaign did not respond to numerous requests for interview. Debbie Dugan, chairwoman of Keep Massachusetts Safe, the ballot committee behind No on 3, wrote in a Boston Globe article in August that the transgender rights law's definition of gender identity makes it ripe for abuse by criminals and convicted sex offenders. Attendees of the Yes on 3 viewing party, who continue to celebrate behind me, say they hope that their victory sends a powerful message that everyone in Massachusetts is welcomed and valued including transgender people. In Boston, I'm Matthew Nixa, BU News Service. Coming up next on BU TV, analysis on the midterm election results. College of Communication Dean Tom Fiedler joins Adrian Thomas to review whether social media posts could predict the results in key Senate races. Dare you. I dare you to change the world. Dare you. Getting that college education? I dare you to be somebody important. Like be a teacher. Or a reality TV star. I dare you to stand up here. To call the shots. To be a role model. An inspiration. An innovator. To be a teacher. Think you can change my life? Make me excited about science like you? Have a career that really means something? Then do it. I dare you. Here's to the things that can keep us safe. Those we use all the time with hardly a thought. Those that are silently standing by to save our lives. And now, those that we carry with us everywhere we go. Many mobile devices will now bring you wireless emergency alerts, real-time information directly from local sources you know and trust. With a unique sound and vibration, you'll be in the know wherever you are. Do social media posts reflect what voters are thinking? Or does social media pre predict election results? BUTV reporter Adrian Thomas joins our election analyst, Dean Tom Fiedler, with a look at an innovative tracking software. Thanks, Jackie. I'm joined by BU College of Communication Dean Tom Fiedler. And uh, we're going to be reviewing some of the election results from last night and comparing those with trends on social media. Uh, last night for the BU News Service, we were utilizing Crimson Hexagon software, which basically tracks how people are feeling about candidates in some of the biggest race and some of the biggest uh, Senate races across the country. Dean Fiedler, thank you for being here oh. this morning. Um, so let's get right into it. One of the biggest races um, of the night was in Texas between right. Democrat Beto O'Rourke and incumbent Republican Senator Ted Cruz. Um, Ted Cruz won last night with 51% of the vote, but um, let's get right into to uh, analyzing some of the social media mm -hmm. trends and comparing those with some of the election results. So we'll start with um, Beto O'Rourke, and what are some of the significant um, details right here? Well, I think one, one of the things that uh, pops up right away, and you, you mentioned that uh, I think what, what uh, we see here with social media is a measurement of feelings. Uh, our, our question going into this is whether the uh, feelings of the way people express them on social media, Twitter in this particular case, would actually be a proxy for how people might vote. Uh, I think based on the results here, you may say that doesn't quite fit. But what we saw with Beto O'Rourke, which I do think was interesting, was um, the intensity of the support for him. There hasn't been a Democrat elected 
to a statewide office in Texas since 1988. So 30 years have gone by. But um, what, if you look at social media, if we look at uh, the posts uh, during the course of that campaign, Beto O'Rourke had significantly uh, more social media postings than Ted Cruz did in his victory. Yeah, it, uh, and that, yeah as we can see, um, since September 1st all the way up until Election Day, 4.7 million posts. Right. Um, and we're looking at, this is kind of the emotional gauge right here, 26% of those posts were positive. Uh, but then you mentioned how Ted Cruz had significantly less than O'Rourke. So here are Cruz's numbers. Um, mm -hmm. So what are what are we seeing right here? And and if you look at, uh, I think one of the things that uh, the software enables us to do is you get what's called a sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. So you look at whatever words are used. Is this a positive or a negative view at the candidate? And um, again, uh, almost in a contradiction, we see that Ted Cruz, even as the winner, had a more negative posting. I think what this um, probably tells us is that Beto O'Rourke's followers are much more engaged on social media, uh, perhaps much more positive in their view toward him. And in fact, there's another uh, measure in there it, uh, on the emotional response, and he had a very high area, what we call joy. And, uh, uh, and Ted Cruz was seen negatively by many of those people, but clearly, the, uh, uh, and the, the number of people who were active on social media uh, d did not translate into votes. Maybe put another way, a lot of people who were voting for Ted Cruz probably were not active on social media. Yeah. So that um, sense of using social media as a proxy, I think, is probably a uh, questionable one right now. Mm -hmm. Well, and another um, a thing that you just mentioned, how uh, it's, you know, it's very likely that Beto O'Rourke supporters were more active on social media. Mm -hmm. Could make sense. Better work rate um, fund raised nearly double the amount right, of money right. that Ted Cruz did. Um, another thing to mention too that the, the Crimson uh, Hexagon software tracks um, the geography and and where all these tweets are coming in from. So if we zoom in on Texas, we can or we can zoom in on the United States, we can see that the majority of those tweets about Ted Cruz. Um, are coming in from Texas and that there was a significant right. percentage that was negative. Um, so clearly this social right. media data wasn't necessarily corresponding to turnout. To right. turnout. I do think what that would be if, if uh, I was in the Beto O'Rourke camp, I would say there's a lot here to, uh, to take away uh, in the positive sense, whether that uh, sets up Beto O'Rourke for a future campaign, maybe even for a, a, a place in the national discussion in 2020. Uh, I don't know, but uh, but but clearly this election captivated uh, people in Texas probably in a way that we have not seen mm -hmm. maybe in, in decades. Yeah. Um, and we move right on now uh, to the next big Senate race, mm -hmm. um, a Republican um, Rick Scott against Democrat incumbent right. Bill Nelson in Florida. Um, over the past two months, um, Nelson, uh, Scott rather had seven, nearly 751,000 posts on Twitter, and um, Nelson had 413,000. Um, so clearly there's a lot more interest yeah. generated about Scott, but um, one of the things you mentioned last night during our live streams was some of the significant events that have happened in Florida over the right. past two months, Hurricane Michael being... Um, the uh, big one, yeah. yeah big one, Hurricane yeah. Michael. Certainly, uh, when you're the governor of a state that's undergoing or facing a situation like a natural disaster, as Hurricane uh, Michael clearly was, there's a lot of uh, of television time, a lot of time in the media there, and we saw that uh, that bump that uh, that he enjoyed. Also, President Trump made two trips mm -hmm. to Florida in the, really the closing days of the campaign. That stimulated it. Uh, if I would look at the social media going back, and this race, by the way, is still in that almost too close to call category. I think the likelihood of Bill Nelson winning a challenge is probably very small. But um, the one thing that you would see in the social media uh, commentary about Bill Nelson is not a lot of high emotion. There was, again, one of the factors that the, the uh, Crimson Hexagon software measures is uh, that sense, the positive and the negative, but also neutral. And the great majority of voters for, uh, for Senator Nelson, almost three quarters of them, were in yeah. a neutral phase. That isn't, uh, isn't a place a candidate wants to be if you're trying to drive turnout. Yeah, yeah, the neutral numbers um, are significantly much higher than um, 
for Nelson, then Scott. Um, right. One more quick thing to mention with the Florida Senate race, um, that race could potentially head into a recount. Right. Um, but the big detail there is that the only person who can authorize the recount is the Secretary of State in Florida, Ken Densner, who was appointed by the Rick governor. Scott. So this yeah. will be something could be that, tricky. Everyone's, that everyone's going to be yeah. closely following over the next day or two. Yeah. Um, but we are gonna we are gonna toss back to Jackie now. Uh, that's it for uh, yeah. BU TV news social media analysis of the midterm elections. As always, stay tuned to the BU News Service and BU TV Ten on election night for all the latest coverage. Jackie, back to you. And that's it for the special midterm election wrap up. I'm Jackie Contreras. Thanks for watching and have a great day.